everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is my leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting and on the last verse. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all arms. new revelation last night I found out that I was short I never knew that <laughs> that's why I've come to learn yeah they they already know but anyway that, that was funny um, I did want to mention to all the ladies here um, you know Fred Tyker had passed away last week we're doing the service for him this Friday and uh, Medrith has asked us to, to have a lunch in. They're going to provide the meat from the family, but I need some ladies to bring some dishes to pass, uh, salads, and Debbie will coordinate what, what we need. But just to put you on notice for that, uh, if you can help out with that, uh, some of the dishes and desserts to pass, they're going to provide the meats. And so that's going to be Friday at noon. We'll have that service for uh, Fred Teichert and his family. And so if you could just be thinking about that, and I'll get with Debbie and she'll uh, post the things that she needs for that. We really appreciate your help uh, with something like that. It's always a blessing to the family, uh, for sure. All right, uh, we're going to take up an offering right now, Brother Harry. And uh, uh, our Sunday school offering is going completely this morning uh, to uh, the Creation Evidence Expo group. We're going to take up another offering tonight, plus we have uh, a, a, an amount set for that as well. And so uh, everything that comes in for Sunday school, uh, we, we support one of our missionaries from our Sunday school, but uh, we're doing well with that. And uh, this morning it's all going to go toward the... Uh, Amen. Thank you. <laughs> it is a mission too, isn't it? So, and then tonight we'll take up a special offering as well. Uh, and so keep that in mind and just ask the Lord what he'd have you do. Um, I did appreciate when I, when we, Brother Boyd and I were talking and I just, out of curiosity, I said, well, you know, what do we, what, what do you need to be able to come? And he says, uh, we don't charge a thing. We made a covenant with the Lord that we weren't going to set a certain amount. And uh, I think that's a good way to go about it. But on our part, we want to make sure that we help them out with expenses and, and honor him uh, uh, for their time and, and uh, knowledge. Amen. Uh, I found out I wasn't the smartest man in the room last night. Teasing. Never thought I was. But uh, so let's look to the Lord. Word of prayer and ask God's blessing. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful this morning for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of fellowship that we have in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, around your word and the truth of your word. Lord, thank you for those who've given their life to study uh, aspects of the truth uh, to help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to help us to become better equipped to share our faith with others and to defend our faith uh, before others. 
So Father, I pray that you'd bless the Sunday school hour this morning, the morning service, the evening service, meet spiritual needs. May we be a blessing uh, to those that are here with us as well. We ask these things now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now am I just gonna turn it over to Brother Jay or did you wanna come come on up here then or right down in the front, they can, they can hear you okay. That sounds good. That's why that was so good. Let's try that again. Act like you're in Ann Arbor watching a Michigan game. Go blue. <laughs> you say go blue. Good morning. Go blue. That's a whole lot better. I think I heard four people this time. At, who is the who is the chief clerk in the here at the church? The one that records everything. As far as reporting what? No, uh, announcements and so forth. Who the, who writes all that back? I got yeah, Debbie Jewell. Debbie, Debbie, where are you at? She is the Sunday school class. All right, she's A W O L. <laughs> well, I want to before Jay comes this morning. Uh, I've shared. Every September in Indianapolis, Indiana, we have a weekend free, and I'll say free, free, weekend conference. And some people already got excited about coming to Indianapolis for our free weekend conference. The dates for our 2024 annual conference in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is the home base of Creation Evidence Expo, is September. Write this down, and I'll give this to Debbie, or, and we'll be in emailing with pastors so you won't get amnesia and forget about us. September 13th, 14th, and 15th in Indianapolis, Indiana, on the west side of our city, the Hope Baptist Church will be our uh, eight, our 18th, 18th Creation Evidence Expo conference. Dr. J will be one of the speakers, and we have men from all over the country will be in Indianapolis to teach you. It is an awesome weekend. The conference is free. You go to Ken Ham. Answers in Genesis is a tremendous charge. But when we started this in 2006, the Lord said, don't charge because people, there's some people can afford this, but there's a whole lot of people can't. We want to help the body of Christ. So and this is our 19th year of work. We never charge. You see, we're still operating. You know why? Because people bless the ministry. Now, y'all didn't know this, and I hope this don't offend my speaker, but Dr. J is one of our supporters for the ministry. He was sponsored as well as the speaker. Isn't that wonderful? Well, y'all give him a hand then. It just <laughs> and, uh, he supports this ministry as a sponsor, this, this company. <clears throat> So write those dates down, and I'll give more information to the uh, uh, Debbie. And I want you all to, <coughs> I already had several say, well, you say, Pastor, that's three hours from here. Uh, I hope you all haven't got amnesia. Remember, we drove three hours from Indianapolis here. Is that right? And we're here. So you all come, pay us back in September. Come, good group of you. And let us invest in your life the truth of creation. And you get to hear Dr. J again. And our top uh, presenter, Bruce Malone, will be there. It's going to be. And I, I may have a special surprise for you guys before we wrap up tonight. I ain't going to tell you. I won't keep it a secret. But good things are good. All right. All right so uh, it's good to be here this morning. Session number three, Dr. J is going to come. And this lecture he's going to give you transformed my ministry. I have some things that I have been 
wondering in the scriptures why he gave this presentation. And uh, I tell you, it was the answers I was looking for. We're going to come and share. You ready to rock and roll? Yeah, don't play it up too much. <laughs> <laughs> then now they're expecting a lot. Well, <laughs> Good morning. So uh, I, someone asked a question last night and uh, gave a brief answer to it. This is going to answer it a little more uh, uh, in depth. So this is the Bible, a great source of modern science. When I started learning science, I was an atheist. The more science I learned, the harder it was to be an atheist. So I believed in some sort of creator, but I didn't know who this creator was. So I, being the nerd that I was, I read a lot of books uh, and so I read uh, the Quran, I read the Bhagavad Gita, which is Hindu scripture, I read the Tao, uh, and then I read uh, the Old and New Testament. And what I found different about the Old and New Testament the, the, compared to all those other books is, especially the Old Testament, had an enormous amount of science in it. Science that I had already learned, but science hadn't learned it until fairly recently. But the Bible always had it. So, for example, the cultures around the Jews had this idea that the earth had to be supported by something. And so it depended on the culture, but basically there was something holding up the earth or the universe or something like that. And so this is the Greek view. There was a titan, and the earth was held up on the back of the titan. And just as a brief aside here, this is a copy of a statue that was made in 200 B.C. Notice the shape of the earth. If you were taught in school that ancient people thought the earth was flat, you were lied to. Nobody of any significance ever thought the earth was flat. Even uneducated sailors understood that the earth is round uh, because they could watch a ship leave port and they would see its hull disappear before its mast. And when the ships came back, they would see the mast before the hull because they knew it was going over the edge, uh, over the curve of the earth. So nobody of any repute in ancient, there are more flat earthers alive today than there were in ancient times. Um, because we've devolved into silliness. <laughs> so anyway, that's just a point I wanted to, to, to point out. This isn't the main issue here. So anyway, this is what J Greeks thought. However, the Jews never thought anything like that because the Bible said something radically different. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. This was unimaginable to any culture at this uh, around the Jews because how could something be stable like the earth and not be supported by something? But the scripture says it's just hanging out there on nothing. And in fact, if you look out, this is an amazing picture. This is a picture taken by a Mars rover on Mars of the earth and the moon. And that's what you see. The earth is out there hanging on nothing. Right? So it's exactly what the scripture said. You know, it took science a long time to figure this out. But the scriptures knew it from day one. All right. Also, the Bible was first to describe the hydrologic cycle. And that's a $20 word that describes how Earth recycles its water. So when you take a drink from your Dasani water bottle, the sewer that they took that water from, a lot of that water was probably in the ocean at one time. But it ended up in the sewer because the Earth moves its water around. And that's called the hydrologic cycle. Now, the first document to talk about the hydrological cycle was the Bible. Job 36, 27, and 28 says, For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. So that's evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. And then Ecclesiastes 1, 7 makes this statement that was unfathomable to the people at the time. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. So it's saying all rivers drop into the sea, and that's true. All rivers either dump into the sea or dump into something that dumps into the sea. So the rivers drain to the sea, and yet the rivers never empty, the sea never gets full, because the earth sends the water back. And we now understand that. It evaporates from the, uh, from the ocean. It makes clouds. Those clouds move, and they fall. Uh, and then rain falls and fills up the rivers. That's all right there. Now, science figured this out in the early 1600s. 
Before then, it was honestly thought that there was a big reservoir of water at the center of the earth. And the water pumped, uh, and the, the water was pumped by the earth up to the mountains. And supposedly that's how the river stayed full. And that was scientific consensus <laughs> for a long time, until really the 1600s, when science figured out, no, no, there aren't any pumps, there isn't any uh, a big reservoir of water down below. It's all just the earth moving its water supply around. Uh, and so the Bible, once again, way ahead of science when it comes to understanding that. Another place the Bible was way ahead of science is the Bible knows that air has weight. It has mass. And this was just uh, a mystery to scientists be, uh, uh, in early times because if you walk around the air, it certainly doesn't feel like it has any weight, does it? Right? Uh, and so it, you don't feel the weight. So it was taught as fact that air had no weight. But the Bible always said something different. For he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven to make the weight for the winds. So the winds have weight. And he weigheth out the waters by measure. Now this was absolutely against scientific consensus until 1640. When 1640, a guy by the name of Evangelista Torricelli, he wasn't even worried about air. He was trying to make a vacuum. So he filled this big cylinder up with mercury, put his finger on it so he could get some cancer, turned it over, and then immersed it into some mercury and let, it, and, and let his finger out. What he thought would happen was all the mercury would fall out of the cylinder and he'd have nothing in the cylinder and he'd have made a vacuum. What happened is the mercury went down for a little bit and then stopped. And then he noticed when the weather changed, the place where the mercury stopped changed. Basically, he had made a barometer, which measures the weight of air pressing down on the barometer. So at that point, science figured out that air does indeed have weight. But it wasn't science that first figured that out. It was scripture. And this is something I'm going to point out a couple of times because it's important. Prior to 1640, if people thought this way, and people really didn't think this way back then, but back in six, prior to 1640, if people had read this verse and listened to science, they would say, well, wait a minute, this scripture goes against science. Because science teaches as fact that there's no weight to the wind. The scripture teaches there is weight to the wind. So science and scripture are at odds with each other. The reason they were at odds was science was wrong. And when science corrected itself, it came in line with scripture. This is a constant story in science. In science, we always have these times when science and scripture seem to be at odds. But the more we learn, the more we realize it's science that's wrong, not scripture. Uh, and you'll hear that again, because it's important. Uh, one of the most interesting characters related to all of uh, the science you see in the Bible is Matthew Mari. This is a portrait of him. As you can see, he was in the Navy, um, and he was a navigator. It was his job to get ships from one place to another uh, and, and in the shortest amount of time and so forth. Well, he ended up having an accident. It wasn't an accident on a ship. It was an accident uh, uh, that was while he was uh, working on his house. He ended up getting a real gash in his leg. And medicine wasn't great back then. It got infected. And so he spent a lot of time in a bed trying to recover from this you know, infected gash. Um, and so since there wasn't Netflix back then, uh, he did a lot of reading. And of course, he was a Christian, so he read the Bible. He would read so much that his eyes would get tired, he'd have his kids read to him. Uh, and one time, his son, we don't exactly know, one source says it was a son, other source says it was a daughter, but one of the kids was reading Psalm 8. When I consider the work of thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visiteth him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Now this psalm is about how we don't deserve God's uh, attention, but he gives it to us anyway. Right? And, and that's the main meaning here. But Matthew Mari was listening to the, his son or daughter read this, 
and had the child stop and read this over and over again. Because he said, look, the guy who made the oceans is telling me there are paths in the ocean. And as I'm a navigator, I should find those paths. Because it's always easier to travel on a path. So he said, if I ever get out of this bed, I'm going to find these paths. He got out of that bed, and he did find these paths. We call them the shipping lanes. There are currents that stay constant. The red arrows are warm water. The uh, blue arrows are cold water. And these currents stay really, really, really constant. If your uh, boat is on one of these currents, it travels three to ten times faster than if it's off the current. So before Matthew Maury, when we wanted to get to the United Kingdom, to the, uh, to the uh, colonies, we would go straight. <laughs> we would be fighting this current almost the entire way. So that made you go really slowly. After Matthew Maury, they figured out, hey, what we need to do is get on this current, go all the way down to the northern part of South America, then catch this current and go up to the colonies. Even though that's a lot longer, it turned out to cut days off the journey. So Matthew Maury's discovery made the earth a little smaller, made it easier to, tra to uh, uh, travel from one continent to another. And even though we don't have wind-driven ships really these days, we still use these uh, uh, shipping lanes because in the end it saves fuel. If you go with the current, you're going to spend less fuel. So this is a, a monumental achievement in early navigation. It's still used today, and it's all because Matthew Maury understood that when you're reading the Bible, you're reading the words of the one who authored nature. And so when you read those words, you can learn things about nature because you're listening to the author. Um, when he died, the state of Virginia, uh, with money from the U.S. Navy, built a monument to his honor at his favorite location, this place called Goshen Pass. And it's a neat, neat little air, uh, wilderness area, but you can look out on the port and watch the ships leave. And once he could never get back on ships once he recovered from his leg wound, but he liked to, he used, used to like to go out there and watch the ships leave. So they made this little monument to him there, and it says this in part, Matthew Fontaine Mowry, the pathfinder of the seas, the genius who first snatched from the ocean and atmosphere the secret of their laws. His inspiration, holy writ. Psalms 8, 107, verses 3, 23, and 24. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 6, a tribute by his native state. Think the Navy or the state of Virginia would make a monument that said these things today? <laughs> Back then, they were okay with talking about facts. And the fact is, Matthew Maury wouldn't have made this discovery if he didn't believe the Bible was inspired by God. Right? And that's the kind of science that really pays off in the end. All right? Uh, and in fact, he wrote a book called The Physical Geography of the Sea, which became the first, and at its time, the most important oceanography textbook. And in that textbook, he regularly quoted scripture. And that upset some people. He gave a speech towards the end of his, uh, towards the end of his life at a university, and he says this, I have been blamed by men of science, both in this country and in England, for quoting the Bible in the confirmations of the doctrines of physical geography. That's what they used to call oceanography. The Bible, they say, was not written for scientific purposes and is therefore of no authority in matters of science. I beg pardon. The Bible is authority for everything it touches. That is the perfect statement right there. Yeah, sure, the Bible wasn't written for science, but when it talks about science, you better listen because it was written by the guy who, who, uh, who built it all, right? So the Bible also knows about thermodynamics. Uh, I teach thermodynamics to engineering students. Uh, most engineering students don't understand thermodynamics. Several of my colleagues don't understand thermodynamics. Uh, there are multiple laws and multiple caveats, but there are two really, really important laws. One is the first law of thermodynamics, which most people know in some form. You can't create or destroy energy. Uh, you can transform it, so these lights are taking electrical engineering, electrical energy and transforming it in, in, into radiant energy, but they're not creating the light energy, they're just transforming it from the electrical energy, right? The second law of thermodynamics says something much more important. It says the universe will eventually end. Because, it turns out, every time you trans 
uh, uh, transform energy from one form to another, it actually disorders the universe a little bit. And in the end, eventually the universe will get so disordered, it'll stop working. The Bible was the first to talk about this. Psalm 102, 25 and 26, Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. Now please understand, prior to 1850, this went against the scientific consensus. Prior to 1850, the scientific consensus was the earth and the universe are eternal. They have always been here, and they will always be here. That was taught as scientific fact. So prior to 1850, you could say, here's the place where the Bible and science disagree. In 1850, a brilliant guy by the name of Rudolf Clausius was just playing with math. He wasn't even doing experiments. He was just playing with math. And he wrote a paper, and he said, okay, here's a bunch of equations all physicists believe. Here's some math, and here's my conclusion. The universe is going to end. Because my equations tell me every time we do anything to transform energy, or every time the sun does anything to transform energy, in the end, it makes the universe a little messy. And the messier the universe, the harder it is for the universe to do its job. So eventually, the universe is going to end. Nobody liked that. Because first of all, it went against scientific consensus. And secondly, we don't want to think about the universe as ending. So scientists fought against this. They tried to find problems with his math. They tried to do experiments to show the conclusion was wrong. But after many, many years, scientists were drugged, kicking and screaming the entire way <laughs> to the fact that, yes, the universe will come to an end. As Dr. Duane Gitch says, many years of careful measurements by scientists repeated many thousands of times established beyond doubt the scientific truths expressed in that verse of Scripture. So for thousands of years, science had it wrong. The Bible has always had it right. So prior to 1850, if you were concerned about the fact that science and uh, Scripture were, were, uh, uh, were disagreed on this point, all you had to do was wait, because you'd eventually find out that science was wrong. Scripture was correct. Uh, science knows about modern, or the Bible knows about modern medicine as well. Science eventually figured this out, took a lot of time. Uh, the Bible had a lot of this from the beginning. So you probably didn't think you were going to learn about circumcision this morning. Uh, but circumcision is described in Genesis 17, 12 through, uh, 10 through 12. It's required of all Jewish males on their eighth day of life. And if you actually read some of the commentaries made by the culture surrounding the ancient Jews, when they learned about this practice that the ancient Jews did, they thought it was kind of barbaric. right? And they didn't quite understand why the Jews would do this. But of course, the Jewish people were doing it because the scripture said to do it, so they did it. In the, early, in the late 1940s, we figured out why, at least one of the benefits of it, if nothing else. Uh, in the late 40s, there was a study done of, of uh, more than 86,000 women in the, in the Boston, Massachusetts area. They were looking at other things, but one thing they noticed was that Jewish women were eight and a half times less likely to contract cervical cancer than non-Jewish women. Now, this is a huge number in, in medicine. You don't normally see numbers like this. To give you an idea, we all know we're not supposed to smoke, right? And one reason we're not supposed to smoke is you can get lung cancer from smoking. If you smoke two packs a day from the time you're 18 to the time you die, you are twice as likely to contract lung cancer as someone who's never smoked a day in their life. Twice as likely. If you're not Jewish, you're eight and a half times more likely to get cervical cancer if you're a woman. That's huge. So, of course, scientists wanted to figure out why, so they did follow-up studies. The only discernible distance that, difference they could find is that Jewish women were married to circumcised men. At this time, we didn't know what caused cervical cancer. But because of this fact, they started investigating cervical cancer as a sexually transmitted disease. And they're right. We now know it's called, caused by the human papillomavirus, HPV. And even though people don't like this connection, and you'll find doctors saying, oh, circumcision has nothing to do with cervical cancer, all of the studies say exactly the opposite. Uh, just uh, in 2009, a big study was published in Nature and found out that non-circumcised men were three times more likely to carry that virus than circumcised men were. So it's a direct link. So 
Circumcision protects the female population against cervical cancer, which is a deadly disease. So that's probably one reason God said to do it. But why on the eighth day? You know, why not as soon as they're born or why not before they get married? You know, why on the eighth day? Well, it turns out modern medicine finally figured this out too. Because circumcision is a surgical procedure. You end up cutting the skin. What happens when you get cut? You bleed. Why don't you just lose all your blood through that cut? Cut, Because the blood clots, right? And spills off the wound. Well, the blood clotting process is ridiculously complex. Uh, uh, there's a fellow, Michael Behe, who has said, you know, the only way you can explain the blood clotting process is that it was designed because it's ridiculously complex. But there are two really important players. One is vitamin K. When you're born, you have no vitamin K in your system because your mother's womb is an antiseptic location. There's no bacteria down there or anything. When you start drinking your mother's milk, you start, uh, uh, the, your mother's milk is full of bacteria and you start uh, auditioning those bacteria. Your body kills most of them, but the ones your body knows will help it, it keeps and allows them to go into the small intestine. And so those bacteria that that, that, uh, that your body wants to keep, go into your small intestine, and it's everything a bacterium loves because it's warm, it's dark, and it's wet. So they start you know, proliferating like crazy. They start digesting things that you can't digest, and as a way of thanking you for food and housing, they start making vitamin K for you. So your vitamin K levels start rising as, you start, uh, as these bacteria start reproducing and so forth. By about your sixth day of life, you have all the vitamin K you need for good blood clotting. In it's standard practice now for a newborn baby in a hospital, unless you ask otherwise, to get a shot of vitamin K right away. They usually give an infant a shot of vitamin K right away because it reduces internal bleeding problems. You know, uh, so uh, that's important. But the other big player is prothrombin. If you go to the doctor to have pro-time tests, it's measuring the level of prothrombin in your blood. Prothrombin, when you're born, you have a lot of it, almost as much as you need. However, your body has to stop making prothrombin because your body has to get rid of your mother's chemistry. Some of your mother's chemistry during natural birth, some of your mother's chemistry gets into your body. You got to get rid of that because it's bad for you. So your body spends the time fighting your mom's chemistry for a while and stops making prothrombin. By about your fourth day outside the womb, You've gotten rid of most of your mom's biochemistry, but now you're really low on prothrombin. So it starts making prothrombin like crazy. At day seven, it reaches 100%, but it actually overshoots because it's making prothrombin so much. So on your eighth day of life, you have more prothrombin in your bloodstream than you will ever have again. So what's the very best day in your life to be cut? <laughs> your eighth day. Now, did Moses know about human pampilomavirus, cervical cancer, and the blood clotting process? No. But the guy whispering in his ear did. And that's how, that's, that's how we get this. And this is the way the Lord works. Uh, when I'm reading about, about uh, 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 circumcision, I'm not a Christian. I'm just reading all these different scriptures and everything. I'm reading about circumcision, and it says eighth day of life. About a month or two prior to when I was reading that, I did a book or a, a school report on blood clotting, and a graph like this was in the paper that I had read. So I already knew, even though most kids my age wouldn't have known that, I knew about this graph already. And then suddenly when I'm reading Book of Genesis, <laughs> it says eighth day. I was like, how in the world did, did Moses know this? How, you know, at that time, I honestly believed that the Bible, I honestly believed all of, this, all of the ancient scriptures of all the religions, that they were written by ignorant savages. Because that's the impression I had in high school about ancient people. They were just savage and ignorant, right? So I honestly, I thought to myself, how did this ignorant savage know about the human papilloma virus and know about the eighth day? It wasn't the ignorant savage who knew, and he wasn't an ignorant savage. He was probably one of the most well-educated people on the earth at the time. But still, even the best educated people on earth didn't know about this. The guy whispering in his ear did. All right? The Bible also knew about germs long before science did. So 
This is a, uh, 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 something that you typically don't hear preached about in church, but you should read Deuteronomy 23, 12, and 13. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, outside the camp, whither thou go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. If you're not quite understanding what the Bible's saying here, it says when it's time to answer the call of nature, don't do it in camp. Go outside, dig a hole, do it in the hole, cover it up. Right? And that makes perfect sense to you and me, and if we actually go camping, I would never go camping this way, but if you actually go camping, you know, in primitive conditions, you know you have to do that, right? right? But understand that this was a radical idea for the time. At the time, if you were poor, you simply found a dark alley to relieve yourself in. If you were rich, you found a chamber pot to relieve yourself in, which was then tossed into the dark alley. So either way, cities and camps and so forth were just filled with human refuse. But the Jews didn't have that problem. And as a result, cholera, dysentery, and typhoid were pretty much unknown to the Jews but were big problems during, their, their, during, during ancient times. And it was just because, you know, the Jews didn't know any better. They were just following God's laws. But God's laws were written because he knew what, how to keep his people uh, healthy. Uh, there's a really interesting um, medical historian named Arturo Castiglione. And what he does is he tries to find the first historical uh, 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 practices that we use now today in modern medicine. Uh, and he spends a lot of time in the Bible because there's a lot of great medicine in the Bible. And he calls this particular uh, commandment, quote, a primitive measure, but an effective one, which indicates advanced ideas of sanitation. Where do you think those advanced ideas came from? <laughs> right? Now I'm going to skip ahead here. Sorry. Uh, let's go this. Uh, uh, let's do this one and then we'll do it. And so, um, if you read Numbers 19, 11 through 22, it gives detailed instructions about what a priest should do when he comes into contact with a dead body. And it involves several things. It involves washing himself and his clothes in running water. Because if you wash yourself in a, just a basin, then all of the bacteria you're washing off collect in the basin. So you wash yourself and your clothes in running water. You lay your clothes in the sun to dry because the sun produces ultraviolet rays, which kill bacteria. And there's a soap you're supposed to sprinkle on everything. And it's made by burning together a young cow, cedar wood, hyssop branches, and scarlet wool. This has all the ingredients of modern surgical soap. Because, first of all, it has an irritant, cedarwood oil, makes you scratch. If you ever see video of, uh, of, of surgeons getting ready for surgery, as they're washing their hands, what do they do? They scratch. Because they need to get those bacteria that are clinging to their skin off. Hyssop oil is an antiseptic that kills bacteria and fungi. Wool fibers are a scrubbing element. They help you scrub. If you've ever, you know, uh, gone to a place like that works on cars, the uh, soap that they use is rough. That scrubbing, the rough stuff is the scrubbing elements that help you scrub better. So this soap that is detailed in Numbers 19, 11, and 22 is basically modern surgical soap. We just use different ingredients, but all the ideas are the same. So in the end, Numbers, or the Bible, knew about bacteria and all that long before science did. Um, there's a great book, it's kind of uh, outdated these days, uh, but it was written by S.I. McMillan in the 1970s. And he talks about how science discovered germs. And if you've never heard that story, that's what I usually tell when I don't have time, you should Google it sometime. Google how science figured out that germs were bad for you. <laughs> it's, uh, lots of people died figuring this out. Uh, S.I. McMillan says this about that whole situation. At long last, man finally muddled through. He learned after centuries and at a frightful cost what God gave to Moses by inspiration. This idea that you're supposed to wash yourself after contacting dead bodies, unheard of in ancient medicine, basically until Louis Pasteur comes along. And in fact, surgeons back then would never 
clean their surgery apron because the more blood stains on the apron, that indicated the more experienced you were as a surgeon. <laughs> and it wasn't that we didn't understand there were bacteria. We could see them under the microscope, but they were so small, how in the world could they hurt us? That was the thinking, right? It took Louis Pasteur to show how, that, how they could hurt us. But the Bible told us how to take care of that long beforehand. This was one of the most dramatic things to me when I read it the first time. Uh, it was such an impact on me. I still remember the chair I was sitting in when I read this. Um, uh, Job 9, 5 and 8 through 8, uh, talking about God here, which is God. Which removeth the mountains, they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. Which shaketh, shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars which alone spreadeth out the heavens. And that's, of course, a, a present tense word. So it's happening now, spreading out the heavens. And I remember, once again, thinking to myself, how in the world does this ignorant savage know that the universe is expanding? Because up until 1930, it was taught as scientific fact that the universe is static, never changes. But in 1930, Sir Edwin Hubble produced some data that slowly convinced the scientific world that the universe is expanding. So prior to 1930, this uh, verse was contrary to science. And the reason it was is because science was wrong. And when science corrected itself and said, okay, yeah, the universe is expanding, it come, came in line with Scripture. And this happens more than once in Scripture. Here's another one, Psalm 104, 1-2. Uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, o Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, and who stretchest, once again, present tense, it's happening now, stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. So it took science up to 1930 to figure this out. The Bible had it all along. Because, of course, God made the universe, and he, know, he knows he made it to expand. So that's, uh, that's what really made me sit up and take notice. As someone who didn't believe the Bible and reading all the other scriptures of the, of the major religions, seeing this kind of science in the Bible made me realize there is something really special about the Bible. And tonight, uh, in the evening service, I'm going to give you the rest of the reasons I ended up believing in the Bible uh, 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 to add to that. So... All right, so it's 10.15. Do we do something to end this? Okay, very good. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much that we live in a, world, in, a, in, a, in, a in a country where we can come and do this openly and freely. Uh, we thank you that uh, you, uh, you have us gather uh, and that we can lift each other up. We just pray that we'll spend the rest of today being edified by our fellow believers and being edified by their messages. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.